Winston Churchill, considered by many to be Britain's greatest statesman of the 20th century. But he was also controversial. How should history remember him? Hello, I'm Arnold Naidu and this is The Heat. Winston Churchill is back in the news more than 50 years after his death. The former British Prime Minister is best known for rallying his country and helping defeat Nazi Germany during the Second World War. That theme was the recent focus of a major film, Darkest Hour. In it, actor Gary Ullman won the Oscar for Best Actor at the Academy Awards for his portrayal of Churchill during those critical times. I take full responsibility. Really? Really, yes, sir. It is the reason I sit in this chair. When things looked grave for the United Kingdom, particularly in the early part of World War II, it was Churchill who inspired the British to fight on. We shall defend our island, whatever the cost may be. We shall fight on the beaches. We shall fight on the landing grounds. We shall fight in the fields and in the streets. We shall fight in the hills. We shall never surrender. Early in his career, Churchill served as an army officer during the days of the British Empire, then as First Lord of the Admiralty during part of First World War. Some controversies from that era and later are part of his legacy. For instance, he's been criticized for his role during the famine in Bengal, India, that led to millions of deaths in 1943 and 1944. Well, for more on all of this historic and complex figure, joining us now via Skype from the United Kingdom is Richard Toy. He is a professor of history at Exeter University, and he's the author of three books on Winston Churchill. With us from Beirut is Vijay Prashad. He is the director of Tricontinental Institute for Social Research. Joining us from London is Louise Raw. She is a historian, journalist, and commentator. And with me here in the studio is Michael Bishop. He is the director of the National Churchill Library and Center at George Washington University. Welcome to all of you to the show. Richard, let's start Hello. in Exeter. And uh, let's talk about Winston Churchill. He had a 70-year career that saw him live through two world wars, uh, the end of the British Empire, and also the emergence of the Cold War. How would history view him today? Uh, was he a great wartime leader, or was he much more than that? Was he a complex man with a very mixed legacy? Well, I think he was very complex, and in, the, in terms of how he is remembered, he's remembered very differently according to where you are in the world. So, you mentioned the Bengal famine earlier. That is uh, something which um, means that he is viewed often with a great deal of, of hostility in India, for example. In Ireland, he's probably viewed uh, quite sceptically too. There's the controversy surrounding his actions with respect to Palestine and Greece. Whereas within the UK, he is somebody who is generally, although not absolutely ubiquitously, viewed much more positively with a very, very strong focus uh, on the war years, uh, to some extent on the 1930s when he was uh, campaigning for greater rearmament and warning about the dangers of Nazism. But there is this particular intense focus on uh, World War II, 1940, and indeed a very few weeks in 1940 in particular. Michael Bishop, uh, the movie now, Darkest Hour, that introduces Churchill to a much younger generation, portrays him as the great British leader who saved Britain and Europe from, the, from Nazi Germany. How crucial was a role did he play in that overall fight against Nazism? He played a pivotal role. His voice was a very lonely one, but I think the most powerful one in the 1930s, warning about the rise of the Nazis. But when he became prime minister several months after World War II began, it was at a particularly critical moment when the situation for Britain looked very bleak and there were influential voices in the British government counseling negotiations with Hitler. It was he who held the line. It was he who argued in the war cabinet that that would be a disastrous course of action and ultimately uh, that it would lead to German victory in a very dark age. There's no doubt that the darkest hour was his finest hour. Let's bring in Vijay Prashad. He's in Beirut. And Vijay, there is, of course, a very different view of Churchill, particularly in those countries that were colonized by Britain. One of the biggest controversies surrounds the Bengal famine of 1943 and 1944 and his role in that. Uh, here's what the well-known Indian politician and uh, author Shashi Tharoor had to say about that. Let's watch. <laughs> 
Churchill persisted in exporting grain from Bengal to Europe, not to feed actual sturdy Tommies, to use his phrase, but to add to the buffer stocks that were being piled up in the event of a future invasion of Greece or Yugoslavia. Ships laden with wheat were coming in from Australia, docking at Calcutta, and were instructed by Churchill not to disembark, but to, save on to sail on to Europe. So, Vijay, that's a pretty serious accusation against Churchill there. But at the time, Britain was in a war. Was that criticism warranted or was it unfair? Well, let me just say I was born in Calcutta and uh, I was raised to believe and imagine and as I read to understand that Winston Churchill was essentially a war criminal. Um, this, of course, isn't sim uh, simply what Madhushri Mukherjee in her very fine book shows was Churchill's, whether act of omission or commission uh, in producing the Bengal famine, but it goes back actually uh, through Mesopotamia, uh, through Waziristan, uh, through the war against the Pashtun peoples, uh, where you get a very uh, wide and I think deep picture of Churchill as a racist who prosecuted uh, vicious wars that even his contemporaries found to be excessive. So, you know, there's a way of defending Winston Churchill by saying he was a man of his time. This is, of course, not entirely true because, you know, for one thing, Indians are men and women as well. And when Churchill said that he would like to see Gandhi trampled by an elephant upon which the viceroy would be sitting, uh, this was not something that men and women of his time, uh, particularly Indian men and women, saw as appropriate. So it's very interesting how Churchill's legacy is now being rewritten uh, without the empire in it. And, you know, this is part of the sort of rehabilitation of colonialism, which I think is broadly a very disturbing phenomenon. Michael, I want to give you a chance very quickly to respond to what you just heard there. Yeah, I mean, uh, Churchill's career was long and, and controversial in many ways, but of all the uh, calumnies hurled against him, I mean, this is by far the worst. It's completely outrageous. The famine in Bengal was caused primarily by a cyclone aggravated by the Japanese invasion of uh, Burma, which was the source of India's uh, rice imports, and obviously was taking place in the middle of a world war when shipping was at a premium and when m people were dying by the millions all over the world. The idea that somehow Churchill was responsible for the death toll right. uh, and the, the tragedy is preposterous. The he diverted food supplies from India to Europe. He, he did not. I mean, the thing is, is that he, he, was, he approved okay. of uh, food supplies from Australia, and he was faced, and his co colleagues were faced with a very difficult situation. Uh, keep in mind, keeping Britain in the war effort required keeping Britain fed. So food supplies were at a premium as was shipping. But this is a, this is a complete and total uh, smear. Okay, let's go to Louise. Louise, you recently wrote a piece in the British newspaper, The Independent. You described Churchill's role in Africa when he was a young army officer, <laughs> his role from Kenya to South Africa to Sudan. And you're very critical of him. Uh, expand on that criticism for us. Very critical of him. Yes, and uh, I'm actually glad to be here during Women's History Month as well to speak to the women who suffered under Churchill, the women in Bengal, the, women, the suffragettes in this country, the women of Norway, the women of Greece. But yes, I think um, the accounts I've read of Bengal, for example, rice was being taken away from Bengal. People were resisting that, people were um, injured resisting that. But I think there's no question that that was happening. There's no question there is so much more to this man. St. Winston does not exist. The movie that recently came out, lovely, but it's a movie. He was never on the tube um, heroically talking to the Brits like that. And I also think his legacy is more mixed here too. There may be people who, obviously there are people who admire him, but if you were to go to South Wales, if you were to go to Glasgow, if you were to go to Liverpool, as well as Ireland, there are people who still won't say the name Churchill. I've had friends say, oh, my granny in South Wales would never have his, have his name said in the house because of the way he be behaved against the British working class, uh, British strikers, trade unions and so forth. Richard, I just want to get your take on uh, the Bengal famine, because that's a recurring thing. That comes up uh, many times uh, in, in Churchill's career. Yes, well, I think that um, 
in a sense, they probably come down in the middle, as it, if it were possible, between uh, VJ and Michael, insofar as it's very clear that um, you know, Churchill did say very many you know, reprehensible and indeed ra racist things. He uh, was not keen to step in to alleviate uh, the famine. Um, but of course, Michael is right to draw attention to the context here. Um, I, so I, I feel that although uh, I would actually be strongly critical of him over, over the Bengal famine, the, 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 some of the, the criticism sometimes are actually too extreme, and I think that one does need to draw a distinction between, um, you know, the sins of omission or failing to act quickly enough, uh, you know, versus the, the sort of the question of whether or not he was he was actually a war criminal. And so I think that it's perfectly true to say um, you know, that he did frequently express racist attitudes, and um, and indeed was, as VJ said, um, often seen uh, was criticised by others of his own class and age at the time for doing so. But at the same mm -hmm. time, it's kind of a, a spectrum of, of racism, if you like. And so that at um, you know, one end is perhaps the person who's sort of perfectly non-racist. Um, at the other, you've got the person like, you know, like Hitler who deliberately wants to exterminate people. And you know, Churchill was, was somewhere along that spectrum. But of course, he wasn't um, as extreme. Uh, you know, that, that people sometimes imply that he was, um, he, that his views were, were, the, were the same as, as Hitler's, that he deliberately wanted to commit genocide, and I don't believe that's at all true. Uh, Vijay, one of the top ten controversies of Churchill's career listed by the BBC is Churchill's views on a race. Some have accused him of having very racist views. Uh, he wasn't a big fan, for instance, of Mohandas Gandhi in India. How would you describe his views on India in the run up to independence well i mean let's put it this way uh, i don't think he liked indians he he said we are a beastly people but uh, let's return a little bit if you don't mind not to the bengal famine but to an earlier period in churchill's life where he was of the view uh, much like arthur bomber harris and other people that aerial bombardment the use of mustard gas and other kinds of chemical weapons were necessary as a pedagogical tool to demonstrate to the barbarians, such as the people uh, from the region of Waziristan, uh, such as the people in Iraq, uh, such as perhaps uh, as well later the people in Eastern Africa, that this immense force must be used, uh, including uh, various forms of chemical warfare, to teach a lesson to people so that they would appreciate, as he put it, the superiority uh, of the English. Uh, you know, th these kind of ideas, I think, uh, need to be in the record. I think it's, uh, it's, it's odd that we would like to airwash or you know, uh, airbrush the history of somebody like Churchill. Uh, it uh, leads me to believe that the old colonial attitudes about the use of force in a kind of homeopathic way, or perhaps even worse, in an allopathic way, that this use of force to make people submit and, and believe in the superiority of others is alive and well. So that perhaps the direct line between the 2003 Iraq war and the 1920-21 bombing of Iraq is uh, not such uh, a long line. Michael Bishop, another area of controversy uh, surrounding Churchill was his time as First Lord of the Admiralty during the First World War. Uh, there's a former U.S. presidential, Pat, uh, Pat presidential candidate, Pat Buchanan, who's talked about this. Let's listen to what uh, Mr. Buchanan had to say. But he was a great war strategist, we are told. But the greatest British debacle of World War I was Gallipoli, an ill-conceived drive to force the Dardanelles that cost a quarter of a million British, French, and Anzac troops architect of the disaster, first lord of the admiralty, Winston Churchill. Churchill was demoted uh, after that campaign in Gallipoli in uh, 1915. It's been called Churchill's folly. Was that fair? The Dardanelles campaign was no doubt a disaster as it turned out. However, Churchill didn't really have ultimate control over the entire situation. It was a bold stroke. It was an attempt to get around the constant slaughter on the Western Front and uh, none less than Clement Attlee, Churchill's successor as Prime Minister, later said that uh, Gallipoli was the boldest strategic stroke of the war.
uh, Mr. Buchanan is a, is a lovely gentleman, but um, I think on this he's a little bit harsh. There is, however, no doubt that this cast Churchill temporarily into the wilderness, but he immediately made amends by going and actually fighting in the trenches before coming back to political service. Okay, we need to take a quick break right now. Stay with us. You're watching The Heat as we continue our discussion on Winston Churchill.